Welcome to Bible study. I'm extremely excited to share some truths from the Word today that just truly set me free and set me on a path to deeper revelation and understanding of so many more truths in the Word since then. The teaching today is called Spirit, Soul, and Body. This is Lesson 1. And thank you for joining me. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for all the truth that will be revealed today as we study your word. Holy Spirit, I pray revelation knowledge for every person who is watching and listening to this teaching. In Jesus' name, amen. I will be reading out of the ESV version. I encourage you to get your Bible uh, a journal, something to take notes with, and also to, um, as you study and read the Word, I encourage you to, to use multiple versions, and I believe that it, it just gives you a greater depth of insight and helps the Holy Spirit really bring the Word alive to you. So thank you for joining me. The first scripture we're going to turn to today is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 5 verse 23. First Thessalonians in chapter 5 verse 23. And this verse says, whoop, there it is. Huh. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse 23 makes it very clear that we are three part beings. It says, I pray your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless. Now, many people don't consider themselves as three part beings. They live out of this idea that they are a two part being. The body, which is clear, you can see your body in a mirror, and the soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Now, most people, even many Christians, are used to functioning out of those two parts, their body and their soul. If they look at their body and they feel something wrong on their body, then their soul, their mind, believes that that is the truth, and then they act according to that belief. Or they may feel something in their emotions, or think something in their head, and then they act according to that thought or belief. But 1 Thessalonians 5.23 makes it very clear that we are not just two-part beings, we are three part beings, a spirit, a soul, and a body. In Genesis, it says that we were created in the image of God. God is a three part being. He's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we were created in his image. We are also three part beings. Now, when you start to understand this truth that we're actually three part beings, it will revolutionize your understanding of some of the scriptures that never seemed to make sense before. So let's dig a little deeper into this concept of spirit, soul, and body. First, I'd like to talk about in Genesis, when the Lord told Adam not to eat of the tree. So he says in Genesis chapter two, 
and verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, when you read Genesis chapter 3, and Adam and Eve ate of the tree, did their body die? Well, the answer to that is no. But God is not a man that he should lie. He cannot lie. So the verse I just read you, verse 17 in chapter 2 of Genesis says, In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Well, this seems to be a contradiction in the word because God can't lie. He says if you eat of it, you'll die. Adam ate the fruit and his body did not die. His soul did not die either because he still had a mind. He still could think. He had feelings. He was ashamed. And so how can we reconcile these verses? God said you would die if you ate of it, but Adam was still alive physically and he still had his mind. Well, when you understand that you are a three-part being, you are a spirit, a soul, and a body, then this verse makes sense. Because which part of Adam died? Clearly not his body and clearly not his soul. It was a spiritual death. He was then spiritually dead, which separated him from God. So I'm going to make, try to make a couple functional diagrams. Now I call these functional diagrams because they are um, trying to diagram something that is a spiritual concept. Okay, so we are three part beings. And I'm going to represent these three parts with three circles. Let's say this is your spirit, your soul, and your body. Okay? You are a three-part being. Now, in this, this part here, where the spirit and the soul come together, that the Bible calls your heart. And we'll look at some verses a little bit later about that being called your heart. Your soul consists of your mind, your will, your emotions. Some people call this your personality. Okay? And your body is the physical part, okay? This is the physical realm. In the physical realm, you can see, taste, hear, smell. All of your physical senses exist in the physical realm. Now, your spirit and your soul are existing in a different realm. Your soul is spiritual. I can't see your soul. I can touch your soul with the words that I say, but I cannot see your soul. It is spirit. So, spiritual realm. So I'm going to draw this here. And this is the physical realm on this side of the line. And this is the spiritual realm. Your spirit and your soul exist in the spiritual realm. So there's two realms. There's a physical realm and there's a spiritual realm. So this is the physical realm and this is the spiritual realm. Now, like we said, in um, Genesis, when the Lord said, if you eat of that tree, you will surely die. Well, like we saw, their body did not die. Their soul did not die. So what did they experience? They experienced a spiritual death. 
So that a spiritual death is separation from God. Now, we know that from that day forward, every child of Adam and Eve is now seed of their seed. Well, if you have a watermelon seed, it will produce a watermelon. If you have apple seeds, it will produce apples. Well, if you have a man and a woman, Adam and Eve, who are spiritually dead, their children are now going to be born as spiritually dead people. So herein lies the problem. All of the rest of humanity is coming from the seed of Adam and Eve, who are now spiritually dead. The word for that is a sinner. A sinner is one who is spiritually dead, separated from God. So, let's take a look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. And you who were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all, forgiving us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demand. That this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Okay. Uh, that was actually verses 13 and 14. I want to focus on um, 13. And you who were dead in your trespasses, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Well, how were you dead? How was I dead until I was 29 years old when I got born again? How is that possible? Because I had been born from my mom, so my body was alive, and I had a mind. I could think. Um, I went to school. I earned. You know, I graduated. I earned degrees. I had a mind. I had emotions. I had a will. I made a lot of choices. They weren't very good ones. But for 29 years, just like Colossians 2.13 says, you were dead in your sins. Well, I was breathing. I was walking on this earth. I was thinking. I was doing things. What part of me, again, the scriptures are truth. The, it, the God cannot lie. How is that scripture true? I was dead in my sins. This is how. I was spiritually dead. My body was alive on the earth. My soul, my mind was working. My will was working. My emotions were surely working. But Colossians 2.13 says, I was dead in my sins. That's spiritually. My spirit was dead. It was not alive. Now, look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Let me read that in... Um, King James, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new cre creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Again, how does that make any sense at all? It says all things are become new. Well, when I was 29 years old, the day I got saved, I looked in the mirror and I still looked the same. So again, this presents people with a struggle. 
because they read verses like that and they think I got saved, but I looked the same. I actually had the same memories. I still remembered all of my old memories. So, you know, my mind, I could still do math. I was a math teacher when I got saved and this verse says old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That doesn't make any sense unless you understand spirit, soul, and body. So let's look at the diagram. Okay, so in my three-part being, the day I got saved, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. How are all things become new? Well, remember, I was spiritually dead. This part of my three-part being was dead. So old things passed away. My old nature, apart from the spirit, I had a sinful nature. Sinful meaning separated from God. It was dead. But that old thing, that sinful nature passed away. That died. And I got born again. I got a brand new spirit on the inside of me where it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, all things are new. He is a new creature. The spiritual part of me was born and it was brand new, all new. Now, the rest of my Christian walk Okay, I still have the same body. Now my soul, which is my mind, my will, and my emotions, from the day I got born again, my soul and my body have been on a journey of getting lined up with the truth of what happened in my spirit the day I got born again. Now here is some really exciting things. When you understand that you are a three-part being, you will be able to unleash what is true in your spirit. You will start to be able to release what is true in the spiritual realm out into the physical realm. And we'll talk about that in some more teachings in this lesson that are coming up. But here's what I know. If you continue to operate out of the soul, which is just your mind, your will, and your emotions, you will not experience the truth of what really happened in your spirit the day you were born again. What needs to happen is found in Romans 12 too. Let's go to Romans 12. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let's look at that again. Do not be conformed to this world. Before you were born again, before I was born again, my mind was influenced by all of the things of the world. So I thought like the world. I um, reasoned like the world. I felt like the world influenced my me to feel. My mind, my will, and my emotions, the only teacher that they had was the world. So that's the influence that greatly influenced the way I thought. It was the influence on my soul before I was born again. But Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How does your mind get renewed? See, you're going to act according to the way you think. Every action starts with the thought. You thought about it, whether it was a quick thought or one that had been developing for weeks or months. You think about things before you act, and you act according to the way you think. 
So if your spirit, if you're spiritually dead, you're going to look to your body, your five senses, your uh, taste, hear, smell, touch, um, sight, taste, hear, smell, touch, sight. There it is. And you're going to respond according to the physical realm. But when you're born again, you are a spirit being and you need to learn what's true in your spirit. Now look, there is no direct connection between the body and the spirit. The soul is in between those two parts of you. The soul is the connection that releases things out of the spiritual realm into the physical realm. Your soul needs to be renewed, Romans 12, 2 says. How do we renew our minds? With this, the word of God, Hebrews 4, 12, is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, and it divides, it says, between the soul and the spirit. This will, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Now, the heart is the part where the spirit and the soul come together. And we'll look at a couple verses here to show you that your heart is part of your spirit, new man, but it's also part of your soul, the old man before you were born again. So let's go ahead and look at John 14, verse 1. Let's talk about the heart for a minute. John 14, verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Okay, so your heart can be troubled. Your heart is that part of you in your soul, okay, that will overlap with your spirit. But if that verse, John 14, 1 says, don't let your heart be troubled. See, we're going to look at the scriptures that say your spirit is the identical spirit of Christ. Well, Christ is not troubled. As he is, so are we in this world. And he's not up there worried. He's not sitting on the throne biting his fingernails. He's at peace and joy and experiencing love all the time. He's not troubled. And so in this scripture, it says, let not your heart be troubled. Well, that indicates that your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions contains part of that heart. And so your mind, your will, your emotions can be troubled. And part of that is, it's part of your heart. Now let's look at Ephesians 3, 17. Ephesians three, uh, 17. This one says, Oh, I'm in Galatians. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Okay? So that Christ may dwell in your heart. So your heart is also the place in you where Christ dwells. So how is it that Christ can dwell in your heart and Christ isn't troubled, but John 14, one says, let not your heart be troubled. Well, this is a very good indication. These two ver verses are a very good indication that your heart is actually an intersection place where your spirit, which is where Christ dwells, um, and your soul, which is your own mind, will, and emotions, those, that's the part that can be troubled, but Christ is to dwell in here. And so the heart is the place where that spiritual uh, spirit and that soul intersect. So originally the way that God intended this to work with Adam and Eve 
was that he created the body. He created Adam's body out of dust and he created Eve's body out of Adam's ribs. So he had a body. I call my body the rental car because when I die, when this body dies, I'm getting the new one, which amen, hallelujah, will be perfect and awesome for eternity. But Adam and Eve, he formed their bodies, then he breathed life into them. Well, what did he breathe in? He breathed this spiritual part of them. And originally the spirit and the soul were supposed to work uh, together in harmony. Okay. Now they had different souls because Adam thought like Adam and Eve thought like Eve. So the soulish part is the part that made them individually, but the spiritual part, it's the spirit of Christ. It's the Holy Spirit. We get the same spirit. And so when we're born again, that Holy Spirit of Jesus comes to live inside your heart and all together, this makes up the spiritual part of you. Now, again, when we looked at in um, Genesis 2, when the Lord said, if you eat that tree, you will surely die. We saw again that the part of him that died was this spiritual part. Originally, they were supposed to work in harmony, the spirit and the soul. Um, and with spiritual death, then their, this spirit got separated. So victory happens for us today when our soul, our mind, will, and emotions starts to agree with the truth of what is in our spirit. How do we know what's in our spirit? Again, we're going to read this word and we're going to look at in the next videos a bunch of scriptures that says what's true spiritually for you. The first one we looked at was 2 Corinthians 5, 17 that says you're a new creation in Christ. Old things are past and all things are new. So that's the first thing that's true about your spirit. Now here's a tricky part. See, people, uh, Hosea 4, 6 says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. It doesn't say my people perish because the devil is so evil. It doesn't say my people perish because they don't have enough faith. It doesn't say my people perish because whatever. It says my people perish for lack of knowledge. So saints, the more knowledge of truth, this is truth, the more knowledge of truth that we get, the more we get our soul in line with the truth of what happened in our spirits the day of salvation, the day we got saved. Now, one more thing I'm going to add to this diagram is that the body is in the physical realm. And so in the physical realm, we can look at a physical mirror. To see what's up. We can see if I've got a blemish on my face or if I have anything in my teeth or anything in the physical realm. I can look in a physical mirror to see what's true. Now, the spirit over here in the spiritual realm, I cannot look in a physical body, I'm sorry, a physical mirror to see what is true about my spirit man. This new creature that was created, all things new. I cannot look in a physical mirror to see what's true in my spirit. So how do I know who I am now? Because I've been born again and all things are made new. Who am I? Well, the spiritual mirror, which we will look at in the next lesson. I'm not a great artist here. But the spiritual mirror is the Bible, the word of God. The word of God tells me who I am in Christ, tells me who my daddy is, tells me what he looks like and what I look like. This is our spiritual mirror, the word of God. So saints, thank you for joining me and I encourage you to join me 
on the next uh, lesson in this series. It's going to be great and life-changing. Father, thank you so much for your truth, which sets us free. I pray for increased revelation of these truths for every person who watched this video and heard these words. Father, we thank you and give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I encourage you to check out our website at www.thefishfarm.org and uh, become a prayer partner with us. Come volunteer, hang out on the property. There's a lot going on. Uh, you can partner with us financially in the work that the Lord is doing through this ministry. It's amazing. And lastly, saints, I encourage you to stay in the word. The word works. God bless you.